Hi, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to talk about how virtual reality uh, can affect human behavior and focus on its ability to influence our brain. Eventually, I decided to focus more on VR rather than both VR and AR because actually they have different qualities and which brings also different effects and consequences and I will explain also later. So to introduce the topic, I would like to point out quickly the difference between the different existing reality technology. So we have virtual reality, which is a simulated experience that uh, can be similar or different from the real world, realized through headsets that depending also on the model can uh, include sound experience and remote control. Then we have augmented reality, uh, where interactive experience uh, is visible so it also in, in the natural world and it's overlaid with a layer of digital content. And then we have a uh, mixed reality, which consists of vir virtual objects that are integrated into and uh, responsive also to the, to the natural world. So the specialty of VR, and this is also why it's different from AR, it's, uh, and also other technologies, is the possibility to be in an immersive digital environment and so also the related concept of embodiment and presence. From this point of view, uh, it represents a new technology that still has to see raising new ethical challenges. Um, also because, and in fact, its uh, immersive quality uh, brings the ability to step inside an environment and forget completely the outside world. That's also why it's possible to use it in such a therapeutic uh, capacity, as we saw also, for example, in, in AMAM AMA presentations. So basically, VR make good step to, the, to dissolve or blur the, the boundary between virtual media and the real world. And by a, co a combination of few elements, the brain can be tricked really easily and influence also the, the way we think. The difference from smartphones or computers is uh, that even if the graphics, even if the, the graphics rendering are becoming uh, always greater and better, it is not necessarily blurring the, the boundary and this is why VR is special. So in this sense, we have all, uh, two important concepts. The first one is present, uh, which is our brain distinct way of telling us that uh, an experience is real. And what VR indeed does is activating uh, the motor cortex and our sensory system, so the motor cortex of, of our brain, in a way that is similar to the real experience. And then uh, we have embodiment, which is the feeling of agency and control that you have in your body. But uh, both of, of these concepts, it's not something that we're typically conscious of on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are, these has an enormous impact on, on the perception of the world and, and ourselves. An example of this is called the, the rubber hand illusion, which is a simple demonstration that uh, your brain can actually change what it perceives as a part of you. Basically, um, the original experiment um, has done in a way that people feel that a rubber hand placed on the table before them is their own which brings a shift in perception that is also accompanied by, by a sense of disowning the real end. In the picture, you, you can see basically the same exper experiment with uh, AR in this way, but uh, with VR is actually possible to do that not only with your hand, but with your whole body. In fact, after some minutes, your brain starts adapting and thinking uh, that in the, virtual board, in the virtual world, actually that's your body. Thanks to these ideas of embodiment and presence, VR, VR has a lot of potential that can be applied in many fields, as we already saw, which means uh, it can influence our brain in different ways. I would generalize quickly in personal entertainment, from gaming to visiting museums, watching video, or even shopping. Uh, VR is, a, is an interesting tool for escaping reality for a while. With VR, there, isn't, there is even the possibility to go in so-called virtual rooms, uh, where people impersonating an avatar can meet online and socialize. With the arrival of uh, mass market, the prices of the goggles actually went down. And today for only, so to say, 250 francs, you can actually uh, buy quite a good headset. Then we have business, 
for example, Volkswagen are using uh, VR to design cars. Then we have education, I would say, where different schools, for example, in Canada, are trying to integrate VR in their program. Art students, for example, that were normally reserved and quiet, found that um, in the virtual world, the inhibitions of being embarrassed by, by the people around would actually vanish because these people wouldn't be around anymore. And then we have healthcare, which might be the most impressive impress application. In fact, research has shown that the effectiveness in healthcare provided by VR for physical rehabilitation or psychiatric treatments for treating depression, PTSD, anxiety, and phobias, or even a substitution, uh, it could be also a substitution for anesthesia for chronic pain. Going back to the easiness of tricking the brain, a uh, professional figure can in fact follow people with PTSD, for example, by gradually recreating and elaborate specific situations of their life. And because of this immersive quality, uh, the environments can be created also to encourage empathy, joy, fulfillment, and the, any, any number of pro-social emotions, so to say. In fact, VR can be a medium for changing the perspective for understanding the self. By the creation of avatars of themselves, people can, can develop emotions and awareness uh, yeah, of themselves. For example, virtual environment can be designed to get a first person perspective in order to elaborate psychological trauma. Or another way of treating depression, depression is again uh, changing the perspective of the self through different avatars in order to have su sufficient detachment from habitual ways of thinking about personal problems and, and truly impact self-compassion. And then I would say we have also research uh, as a field. In fact, still uh, a lot has to do done uh, in, in, in this field. So um, VR is a revolutionary development for society as it can bring new opportunities as we move toward a future of uh, immersive technologies and artificial intelligence, we need to anticipate new, the new ethical challenges and, and actually develop practices and policies for a world of deep immersive experiences. But the illusion of embodiment that makes VR great is actually also the heart of its uh, ethical imp implementation. In fact, VR technology can change not only our general image of humanity, but also, as I mentioned before, the understanding of identity and self-perception. Uh, I would sum up the effects in five general categories. So far, um, about long-term effects and prolonged exposure, uh, there, is, n there is no research on, so on long-term long uh, effects and also yeah, on a, on a long exposure to the VR or even uh, for example, on, on adolescents and, and children. But for example, we know that as we saw in, in Christian presentation that actually it's not uncommon for adolescents to, to spend a lot of hours in front of a screen. VR uh, might bring more addiction, psychological change and mental illness as a consequence of prolonged exposure because of this immersive quality and experience. And this is especially relevant for young people as they are developing uh, minds and bodies and might be susceptible to the power of, of this immersive technology. The thing is that uses in school would be limited by a, a professional figure, but actually the availability of the gear at home, as I would say for just 200 francs, for example, would bring the same questions uh, at home. And currently there are no national guidelines uh, regarding the VR. Um, then we have the, the impact of environment on agency and behavior. Um, research in psychology uh, supports the notion that our surroundings, both social and structural, affect our behavior. Our sensing transmit, in fact, information and affect our attitude and, and reactions. With VR, this is an important issue as people operate in immersive artificial environments. The fact is that our daily surroundings are stable but uh, we don't really know how our minds and bodies will respond to diverse and rapidly changing virtual worlds. The results uh, may be positive or negative, but research, as I, as I said before, on the topic is not that far yet. 
for sure. Uh, it has been documented that also on short term psychological changes in virtual environment continue also in the real world. Experiments show that, for example, meeting your older self will also help you prepare for the future. You can see in the picture uh, that in an experiment, people would be faced in, a, in VR with a mirror reflect, reflecting them and their movements by their aged self. The experiments show that actually witness to oneself reduces the emotional gap with the future self and increases self-empathy. Another example is also an experiment where researchers uh, investigated how the changing height of an avatar can influence their interactions with other people. As a result, people with a short avatar were around twice as likely to accept an unfair deal as those in other conditions. Like this experiment, there are many showing how the influence and ability of our online avatar can influence our behavior in real life. In some cases, VR uh, might trigger or aggravate pre-existing and latent emotional or psychological disorders. For this reason, it is important to screen individuals before projecting them to VR experiences and monitor them while the sessions are in progress. As what might be emotionally, emotionally productive for, for one person uh, may prove devastating to another. But actually the question is also who is responsible for that? Then um, there are also many advantages of interacting socially in virtual environments, but existing technology, um, I would say is still only an approximation of the, of the sensoriality of, of the real life. In the real world, we're in fact able to get a lot of, of information through body language, uh, tactility and other vast complexities. And the thing is that these laws or substitutions uh, could have, could have bad consequences for us. So far has been only speculated that VR could lead to uh, dissociative conditions like depersonalization or the realization disorder, which is a sort of dreamlike state that produces a sense that either one's body or one's surroundings are not real. VR, um, in fact, has this capacity to blur the real and the unreal which can also augment the probability that children have to mix up fantasy and reality. And for this reason, the most advanced headsets are not recommended for younger children. Then, and lastly, as with every type of technology, uh, data gathering is an important issue. In that sense, VR take the privacy debate, so to say, to the next level, as the further we merge with the virtual world, the more data, the more data we will release. On the privacy issues, there are actually two layers. So avatars to presentations and data gathering. On one hand, as social networks and internet become virtual 3D spaces, we will more identify with and be identified by our online avatars. And these use raise complex questions about identity, ownership, and yeah, privacy. If a user, if a user uh, create an avatar that is similar but not pixel for pixel identical to another user's avatar, where precisely should we draw the line between theft and accept, acceptable similarity? Or more, also more directly to bias, if in real life a person working for a shop, shopping platform um, where you have to interact with an avatar assisting you, so, which is also a real person uh, wearing VR goggles, Suppose that, for example, as, a, as an assistant, you have dreads, but your, your boss does not allow to create an avatar like that. What should you look like? Do you have the right to portray yourself in the way you are, or is it more a privacy company policy? Does, the thing is also, does the company has the right to control the representation of workers? About this, there are also studies that show that VR can actually solve implicit bias and are really efficient in this. But at the same time, this means also that VR can have the ability to actually make this bias stronger. On the other hand, we have um, another privacy concern about data gathering. In fact, our online avatars in these 3D virtual spaces would, would also mirror our real world movement and gestures. And these motor intentions and movement can be actually tracked read and exploited by advertisers. 
the virtual environments will respond to our body language, occasioning laser precise targeted advertising and neuromarketing, including the strategy of putting us in the very ads and commercial that we are exposed to. In fact, as you can see in, in, the, in the slide now, these are so far the, all the data gathering that actually you can, you can track which as you can see, it's also, uh, as I said before, it's at the next level regarding, for example, other technologies. After these considerations, I would like to expose the possible stakeholders. Um, I would rec recognize uh, four main stakeholders. So first, um, maybe more in, in indirect way, there are the hardware companies who actually are designing the gear. So which also determines what kind of data can actually be gathered then we have the software companies who develops the different virtual worlds and often they also overlap with the gear so with the with the hardware companies for example mark zuckerberg bought for uh, two billions the the company oculus rift saying that one day they believe this kind of immersive reality will become a part of daily life for billions of people. So here we see how hardware companies and software companies as stakeholders can somehow merge. Then uh, I would say there, there is also research centers as, as a stakeholder, which as I mentioned before, they still have to actually understand the effect of VR and this is why it might be actually dangerous. Then we have government, that as we know from the past, um, technology has always been moving with a speed that was too fast to, to kind of follow with the legal aspects. And in this sense, the government, as I mentioned before, that does not have guidelines for VR needs to recognize its risks and, and tackle them somehow. And then lastly, we have society, uh, that in a way I would say we are also responsible for the data that actually we are kind of offering and what kind of use we want of this technology. Also more related to the cultural values in a way. Consent is also an ethical issues, issue and consumers uh, are not aware that VR can, can have a, actually psychological impact. So in a way, this is also our, um, our task to actually get aware of this. So the thing is, how can we deal with these issues and where are the boundaries? Firstly, uh, a first possible solution for designing environments is to diver diversify the designing teams and the people who are creating these types of media. Then also to, to fully understand the power of this medium, we need to have people and students, if possible, also to kind of become creators and get the knowledge somehow and not just be consumers of these virtual environments. In fact, by understanding the design process underlying the creation of virtual worlds, student, students can be better prepared to support immersive experiences. Uh, secondly, uh, the question is also how are developers going to prevent participants in, in games to deal with lasting psychological consequences? We can push designers to have more testing protocols during the design process to understand how their products are making an impact to get the reaction and responses of different people. Because as I said before, actually, the thing is that as all the people are different, they can all react in different ways to, to these virtual environments. And lastly, also regarding privacy, uh, a, sol a solution is really to acknowledge people ab uh, about this issue. Uh, sorry, I, I should mention this picture here. Actually, um, as I mentioned before, there are no guidelines as, at the national level so far, but uh, two psychologists in, uh, in the USA actually have tried to publish a kind of a, a ethical code for the VR use, but it's still something that is not implemented on a national, uh, on a national level. And then, uh, yeah, lastly, so about more the, the privacy, as I said before, a solution would be to actually make people aware and acknowledge them about the, the issue about VR and let them choose if they want to participate. So, we, which means to educate people about legal, ethical and psychological consequences. Because in, in legal actions, as said, uh, 
still is needed to be understood how to go on. And for example, if in a place someone gets injured, so in a virtual environment, so to say, the jury still has to understand how this has to be dealt with. Or again, if abuse feels so real in VR, what kind of consequences does it have in real life in terms of legal actions? The thing uh, to conclude is that the goal with VR is to maximize the freedom of individuals to do uh, what they want with their own minds. But now an important question about, about VR is uh, how would it be possible to restrict this freedom in an intelligent way so that the interests of others are not harmed? Uh, so I'm done and now I'm hoping for the discussion. Thank you.